what's going on. Hello. Thank you, people are joining. Hello, hello. How y'all doing? Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Okay. So while everybody is joining in on my live, thank you for coming on my live. It's been a minute, but um, good morning to you too. So I want to go ahead and just jump straight into it. And I want to discuss the black church. <clears throat> okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Here's my water. Now I wanted to, I wanted to talk about this and, you know, make some content about it but you know i have like my 10 minute 10 minute videos on tiktok but this i knew i was gonna have like longevity like i need a long time to talk about this you know um as queen oh thank you as queen love you ah. um but anyway it was like uh are you a troll we gonna we gonna get you up out of here mute there we go anyway so I wanted to, um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and um, get, in, get straight into it. So I want to talk about the black church and the issues within the black church Christianity. Okay. Now, there are a lot of different things that's go that goes on with religion within itself. That's why I'm not religious. I am spiritual. Like, y'all gonna... This is why I have the Ankh tatted on me, okay? The Ankh. Not a cross, the Ankh. This is honestly one of my favorite tattoos, y'all. Like, the, the favorite tattoo that I have on my body. And then Psalms 46 and 5. God is within her. She will not fall. But anyway, so... <clears throat> I'll start off by saying that... Um, I basically, I was raised Christian, okay, by default. Um, you know how there are people that are born into like Muslim families or Catholic families or like a lot of us are born into Christian families, especially us within the black community. And this is the reason why a lot of us black people have shied away from the Christian church and have gone more of the spiritual route because of just the, you know, just the issues within the black church that so many people deal with. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm sorry. I want to really, I really want to respond to y'all comments. Um, she was like, hello, uh, Mr. C12 Omega. My day is wonderful. I'm blessed and highly favored. Thank you. Have you ever done the egg cleanse before? Yes, I have. I did the egg cleanse before and you know, you crack it in there. You can check to see like, if anybody has is sending you evil eye yeah it actually worked people was sending me evil eye but i have done that um but um said you consider yourself black baby i am a black woman nothing else not mixed with anything else just because i'm a lighter shade of melanin doesn't mean that i'm mixed with anything else yes i am black black hebrew israelite ancient egyptian yes you're mad that i know who i am all right um, sorry, but um, anyway, let's get into it. So basically, I want to discuss what goes on within the black church and why it is so much corruption and why people are tending to leave the church because there is just <sighs> the church is not giving what it's supposed to be giving. Okay, and if you are familiar with Dr. Umar. Dr. Umar, they have his videos going all throughout, you know, like TikTok and stuff like that. And Dr. Umar is a black man and he talks a lot about the church. And he really inspired me to kind of like piggyback off of what he was saying and kind of give my own perspective on it because I've walked through it myself. And the only thing with Dr. Umar is Dr. Umar was raised Muslim. He was Muslim by default, was born into a Muslim family. And then he, of course, has learned about the black church over the course of his life. But me, born into a Christian family, born into the black church, was able to see all that stuff at first hand. 
So, um, and also I want to say this because anybody that wants to discredit Dr. Umar and say that he's a meme or he's this or he's that or he, they want to give all these negative things about it, it's because Dr. Umar speaks the truth and contradicts so many of what people have been led to believe. A lot of people are brainwashed. A lot of people are believing the lies that the church is feeding them and a lot of religious folks talk about how he's negative and how he's false or whatever the case is all because he is calling out exactly what they believe in he's causing them to expand their mind and a lot of people are so comfortable with the lie that when the truth is smacking them in the face they don't want to deal with it that's why people want to discredit dr umar but anybody that's spiritual and knows and is awakened has their third eye wide open knows that that man is telling the truth yeah he they have had dr umar on platforms like he has been on like um, you know how like on CNN how they have like you know a panel of people when it comes to like you know sports and stuff like that or he basically was on this panel on television one time where he was talking to a lot of black politicians it was all black people all black politicians and a lot of these politicians were very very whitewashed they were you know basically feeding into the narrative of what you know like what the white man's world wants us to believe and if you ever go watch that interview you can tell that what was happening is that they were listening to respond but not to comprehend they were talking over him they were disrespecting him and i you know much respect to dr umar because he was really holding his own like they're talking over him and he's still getting his point across they're calling him nays he's matching their energy he's like no we're not gonna disrespect me you disrespect me i'm gonna disrespect you back like you gotta hold your own out there instead of your two feet and ten toes when you out there speaking the truth because people don't want to hear it they kept trying to not listen to him and he's saying Saying, well basically fine y'all want to try to discredit me let me tell you something everybody here on this panel is not the right people that you need to have on this panel because they're way too political they're way too whitewashed and they don't know what they're talking about they're feeling the old white man's agenda basically he narrowed it down to that told them the cold hard truth but anyway so basically um piggybacking off of what dr umar said about the black church is that he said the black church is taking three things away from the black community three of them and what those three are is one our money okay first he said our money our time and our hope money time and hope is what the black church takes away from black people it's a business it's a corporation it's a cult it's not a church it's a cult it's a corporation not a church it's a business not a house of the Lord. That's what it is. They have made it into a business. But a lot of this has started to happen over the past maybe 40 years or so. Right after, you know, Dr. King was assassinated. That's where there was a shift within the black church in a negative way. Like the neg you know, the the black church went on a downward spiral after Dr. King was assassinated. Dr. King was assassinated in 1960s, okay? So in, in the 1970s, that's when all of that, like it was like, you know, the late 60s is where they started to implement that whole shift. And then by the 70s is where it really started to get established. And it was just continuing for decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s, 2020s. Now we are what? Damn, I said 40, it was 60. We 60 years past that. Hello, Bo. Hello. How are you? We 60 years past Dr. King's assassination and all of this corruption is happening within the black church and it needs to be talked about. And what is going to help the black community, what is going to free us from the captivity that they are, come on spirit, that it is, they are holding over us is for us to remove ourselves from the black church that is not doing it correctly. Those of us that actually what we have to do is we have to remove ourselves from the black church and find another way to because really Christianity was a the white the white Christian God the white Jesus the one that they worship that was how the slave masters cursed us spiritually that is the white man's religion that's not what we believed at first us black people when we were slaves we were spiritual those like those Negro spirituals that they talk about the hymns and the songs and all that we were spiritual they gave us a religion and made us follow it and made us, they enslaved us with that religion so that they can make the white people deem superior because they wanted to equate whiteness with divinity because they know that black people are gods. They know that Yeshua was black. They know that Yeshua was African. They know he was. 
but they want to sit here and call him every other race in the book without going to what he actually is. So the thing is, we need to shy away from black Christianity altogether because Christianity, like we need to shy away from Christianity as a whole because that is the white man's religion. It is not truly our God. That's not what we're supposed to be following. You had a, there are a lot of black people that are Muslim, okay? Black people that are Muslim, but they're, they're not as brainwashed and whitewashed as Christianity is. You've had, you have many leaders in, within the community, within the black community, Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a Muslim. Malcolm X was a Muslim. You've seen pictures, you have, there are pictures of Malcolm X at the mosque on his knees praying, praying. The head, the, like the, the hats he would wear, the Muslim caps. He was Muslim. And you know, Malcolm X was about justice. He was about justice. That's why he, he's, he was different than Dr. King. Dr. King was about the peaceful protest. But even then, he even, one of Dr. King's biggest regrets was the I have a dream speech. Because he's like, we need to not be integrated with them. That's what, that's how the white man had kind of brainwashed Dr. King and was using him or whatever. But that's another story for a different day. That's a told up story. Anyway. But the difference is that, you know, Martin Luther King was more of the peaceful protest, the more of the integration, while Malcolm X was more about justice. Don't start no stuff, won't be no stuff. And a lot of Islam is about justice. You know, the whole Christianity thing, they make it feel like, like even just the difference between forgiveness. I know I'm all over the place, baby, forgive me. My ADHD, I'm all over the place, but I gotta push it through. So when it comes to forgiveness, the way that Christianity defines forgiveness is they make it seem in Christianity that forgiveness is mandatory, that forgiveness is ob obligatory. OK, they make it seem like forgiveness is an obligation, not a free will choice. If everything in this world is free will, why is forgiveness the only thing that is not your free will why is it forced upon you why do you have to forgive or else god won't forgive you that's a slave master mentality because it's basically saying i get to treat you because it basically what the slave masters wanted to teach us as black people as we were slaves is you have like this religion says that you have to forgive me or else our creator won't forgive you i could do whatever it is that i want to i can go ahead and i can decapitate your your husbands and your fathers and your sons i can go ahead and tie your black men your strongest black men and the curse of willie lynch tie your black men and have his arms on to one horse his legs onto another horse and smack the derrieres of the horse and have them run the other direction and while he's living split that body in half have guts falling out have intestines and organs falling out and literally the women and children had to witness this with their own two eyes the trauma that we went through baby the genocide that we went through was horrific was horrific baby but you have to forgive the slave master that did this to you Making it seem like, oh, if you don't forgive me, then God won't forgive you. That's utter nonsense. Because it's making it seem, it's basically taking account. It's having the oppressors avoid accountability because I don't have to take accountability. You have to forgive me regardless. And it makes it seem like every single act in this earth is forgivable when it's not. There are evil things that exist in this world. And Islam, Islam is different when it comes to forgiveness. The way that Islam views forgiveness is it's like, listen, if the person, okay, if an oppressor oppresses another person, the person that is oppressed, if the person that is oppressed, the person that is the victim or survivor of the abuse does not want to forgive their oppressor, they do not want to forgive the attacker, they do not want to forgive their assaulter, they do not want to forgive their abuser, then whatever it is that that oppressor, that abuser, that assaulter, that attacker did to the person that is oppressed, the victim, the trauma survivor, whatever it is that they did is going to be held over their head for the rest of their life. That sin, that dark cloud is going to be held over their head until that oppressor finally faces what they have done. Until they finally own up to what they have done. Until they finally seek repentance on what they have done. You seeking true repentance is going to your creator, going to the most high God and being, Lord, forgive me for what I have done. I have sinned. I am, I am wrong. I was wrong for what I did. What I did was wrong for you to admit what you have done is, was wrong and tell it to your creator. Ask God for that forgiveness. That is true repentance. When you can look at yourself as if I was wrong and you can admit that to yourself and you go to God and ask for forgiveness. That 
it's true repentance so at that point it's like if the assault if the person that has been assaulted or attacked or abused does not forgive their abuser that sin is held over that abuser for the rest of their life they're not going to get off scotch free and if that sin is held over their head they're going to go through mental turmoil they're going to be tormented with you know plague spiritual warfare all of that in their head until they face what they have done you know about the about yeshua and judas judas betrayed yeshua for 30 pieces of silver sold him for money sold him to murderers for money oh i like that alliteration sold him to murderers for money and when he had to watch when judas had to stand back and watch yeshua get arrested persecuted whipped they gave that man 40 lashes i mean 30 excuse me forgive me 39 lashes because 40 will kill you they whipped him 39 times ripped part of his flesh off part of his beard was ripped off they put that man through horrific amounts of physical torture and when he, and when judas had to sit back and watch this knowing that he was the one that betrayed him and, and sent him right to those people he couldn't handle what he did so what was happening judas was going through spiritual warfare he was constantly being plagued he had to he had to relive the stuff that he had did had to relive everything had to constantly just be bombarded with guilt he was filled with so much shame and guilt so let me tell you shame is one of the lowest vibrations that we can feel shame is one of the lowest vibrations that we can feel women that have anybody that has been assaulted sexually that has been graped you feel shame that is the deepest feeling that you feel i know it because i've been through there too it's shame that we feel that's why it's so hard for us to heal because we have to face the shame that we feel for what happened to us shame is one of the lowest vibrations we can feel baby so when he felt so much shame people cannot live with that shame i mean he was constantly being bombarded i mean like the spiritual warfare was at his peak he had like you know, he had like black eyed children coming up to him and scaring him and been being all like, well, what is going on? Like he couldn't escape it. He couldn't escape it in his mind. He couldn't escape it in the outside world because what is going on in, inside of you is going to manifest externally. So it was he was tortured. And because because Judas could not handle it, because that sin was held over his head because he didn't repent. He did not repent for what he did. He felt guilty. He felt shame, but he didn't repent. So because all that happened, that's why Judas couldn't handle it. So what did Judas do? Hung himself on a tree. Unalived himself. He couldn't handle it. <sighs> say all that to say that when people do wrong and they feel shame and it keeps following them, they're going to be tortured. It's for, it's for a purpose so that they can finally face up to what they have done so that they can finally actually repent for what they have done. But if they don't repent and they take themselves out of here, you're stuck in the karmic loop on planet Earth, on this dimension, and you're going to come back. You're going to come back in a new body, a new vessel, and you're going to have to do it all over again until you get it right. Earth is the most difficult dimension to master. Why do you think there's so many narcissistic people on this Earth dimension? Because it's, it's hell on Earth for them. They like narcissists be having the, the fun shit fest over here you know what i'm saying but that's why islam views forgiveness differently because it's not about it's about where the person has their own free will on if they choose if they forgive the person or not and for like the Christian people, they have the Christian religion has been preaching that and been forcing us to forgive people. And that's why a lot of people feel so much resentment and they feel like forgiving the person that hurt them is like a disservice to their soul. Let me tell you, when it comes to you can accept what has happened to you to move on. You don't have to forgive someone in order to move on. You can feel indifference. You can feel indifference. Feeling indifference is like I accept what has happened to me. I accept the impact that it's had on me. I accept you as you are, but respectfully, I can move on with my life without ever seeing you again, speaking to you again. And respectfully, I don't want to give you or this situation any more of my energy. I'm turning my back and I'm walking away. 
I feel indifference. So I don't like, am I going to grace you with my forgiveness? No. Am I going to say that I don't forgive you? So I'm your, that sin is held over your head. No, I'm not going to punish you with non-forgiveness. And I'm not going to grace you with forgiveness. I'm going to just simply be indifferent. I'm not investing any more energy into it and I'm moving on. You can feel indifference to move on. You don't need forgiveness. Because now it allows us to have our own free will, our own choices on what we want to do or not. And you see how that is more liberating, that is more freeing, that is allowing you to go within your soul and not being forced all these rules and regulations. Because in the Christian religion, forgiveness is like a rule that you must follow. And if you don't, if you don't follow the rule of forgiveness, then you're just so corrupted and you're just so evil and you're holding on to your pain. And shut up. No, that's not even the case. There are some people that have done things in this world that is unforgivable. So, yeah. Now, let's go ahead and talk about... Um, talk about the black church because I know I digressed a little bit but I'm coming back thank y'all for being patient with me so let's talk again about how I'm piggybacking off of Dr. Umar Dr. Umar said that when it comes to the black church there are three things that the black church is taking away from the black community that is money because somebody put that in there money one is money two is time somebody put that in there and three is hope Somebody please put that in there so that we can see anyway in the comments. One is money, two is time, three is hope. Money, time, and hope. So let's get into it. When you think of money, they take away so much of our money with the whole you have to pay your tithes, you have to have a percentage of your paycheck and you have to give it to the church. Every single Sunday, people are putting money into thank you so much people are putting money into those offering baskets during offering time and what happens is like you have a lot of these pastors these pastors be like grilling people to put money in the put money in the damn offering basket like you know come on man y'all need to like y'all gotta put some money in the bin y'all need to go ahead and pay your tabs because we got to keep the church up we got to make sure that y'all want to have a church to praise and worship in you got to put your money in if you don't why are you not putting your money in like come on put your money in the thing so we can keep the church up we can keep these bills paid we can keep these lights on we can keep this you know electricity we can keep the heat in here every we can keep the water going so you can use the bathroom all of that stuff talking about how it's just really for the the church building when really it's for the pastors to get their paycheck you know all this all that money they want so that they be grilling it trying to make it seem like oh i want you to go ahead and give because we need to like keep the church up when it really is so the pastors can fill up their pockets that's what it is and i can remember going to my church my, I, I live in chicago okay and i went to i i grew up pentecostal christian at an apostolic church and when i tell you it has been plenty of times during offering that like our pastor will be sitting up there like grilling people to put some money in the damn thing like trying to shame us if we weren't going to put money into it not thinking about like you know or maybe people don't got money right now like nah y'all can y'all can put some in there G give me something G give me something like dude calm down like these people be living in big beautiful homes they live in these big mansions and these expensive neighborhoods in the white neighborhoods yes they do because they want to be approved they definitely want the white man's approval they be driving these fancy cars driving mercedes Benz, be lexus so i don't know cars that much whatever expensive cars that they have driving the most expensive cars be having all of this money going on these expensive trips going doing all of this kind of stuff church is taking up a whole block on sixth third that ain't my church that i'm talking about that i'm going to uh-uh it ain't that one but nah you got churches with all this land and you you have churches that are my church has been in existence for not it was 96 that's uh going on 28 years 28 years my church has been in existence and i gotta pick you back because these are not my words i'm piggybacking off dr umar dr umar is talking about how churches need to make sure that they have stuff like you know um you know schools 
for children, having things like like opening up hospitals, you know, having, you know, you know, money for like people to get loans from or, you know, having gardens for food that we can have for like, you know, feeding people, feeding the congregation, feeding the homeless, you know, like with all the money that churches have, they can create like homeless shelters for people. They can create domestic violence shelters for people. They can create schools. They can create after school programs. They can create stuff where they have, you know, just different ways to give back to the community. But why is it that the black churches are not creating anything to give back to the community? You giving all your money to these people every single Sunday, but it ain't nothing that you getting in return. You ain't getting no schools. You ain't schools for your children. You ain't getting no hospitals. You ain't getting no, you know, for the old folks, for the retirement, you ain't getting no retirement homes. You ain't getting no after school community programs. You're not getting no type of, you know, you're not getting hospitals for the sick. You're not having any type of, you know, gardens or foods for people to have. You're not getting anything in return. But all your, it's like you're not getting a return on your investment. You're investing into the church by spending your hard earned money. And you're getting nothing in return because the church is basically the church. They put that money in the banks, in the white banks, and those banks be investing in the kind of stuff. And like the black church, it's a business now. So basically they've become very political, but they're very political behind the scenes because, you know, they want to keep, they want to be in that high socioeconomic status. So they stay, like they take all this money and they're secretly in cahoots with the white man, with the white matrix, just so that they can get all their money, just so that they could be supported because the government be funding these black churches. So if the government is funding these black churches, that's exactly why you have these political people that be coming into the churches when they be on their run towards what they doing. Barack Obama, when he was a senator, came to our church before he had even before he was running for presidency. No, he came twice when he was running for when Barack Obama was running for senator. He came to our church to preach, to talk to people, to get people to get his votes. Then when he was running for president, he came back to our church, came out twice. Rod Lagoyevich, when he was the governor came to our church this was when he still was governor. this is before they had got rid of him you know what i'm saying that's before the whole scandal but at some point when rob glagoyevich the governor of illinois or is it chicago illinois whatever came to our church political people you know using the church to get in and get in cahoots with everybody else the gov like i'm telling you the governments be funding these black churches that's why when you have all these stuff going on they don't be talking about you know um you know the everything that's going on in the world they don't want to talk about that kind of stuff and i guarantee you i guarantee you these black churches the money that they be taking and investing into i guarantee you those banks be take they be taking that money and be sending it over here to fund a genocide that's going on overseas i guarantee you now, I haven't been at, I don't go to church anymore. I haven't been at church, but I would like to know the people that actually go to church ever since October 7th with everything that's been going on. Like, has any church ever talked about it? I would like to know if any church has ever been talking about what's been going on since October 7th and what's been going on in Palestine, what's been going on in Sudan, what's been going on in Haiti, what's going on in Syria. Yemen. What? Talking about the genocide, talk about how they're bombing an entire city of Gaza. Like, are they talking about that? Are they bringing that up? Are they bringing the real legitimate things? Are they talking about it? I personally don't know because I, I haven't gone to church, but I guarantee they probably are not talking about it. If they're not talking about it, I would not be surprised. If they are talking about it, I would be very, very surprised. But I also would like to know if they are talking about it, what exactly are they saying? What are they saying? Let me tell you another thing about how corrupt the church is, is because we're, I can't remember if it was 2014 or 2015, but whenever the United States of America had legalized gay marriage in all 50 states, all 50 states, gay marriage was legalized. I remember going to, I remember right when they passed that bill, that law was passed. I remember going to church that Sunday and our pastor talked about it. And he was talking about how, oh, you know, we are in the last days. We are in the end times. Jesus is coming back. This is the day of redemption. Because look, look at what happened. Look what's going on in the world right now. But this law that they done passed with all this gay marriage stuff, that's just ridiculous. Letting, people, letting gay people be married. This is just ridiculous. It's going against God's word, going against God's will. Jesus is coming back. Look at that. And I remember sitting there like, really, pastor? So you finna hide the fact that you're homophobic under the guise of religion and this whole religious narrative? It was in that moment 
that I had started to think, I had started to see my pastor so much differently because I'm like, dude, you're homophobic. You're talking about, oh, the world's gonna end now because they legalized gay marriage in America? Like, come on now, dude, come on now. Be freaking for real. 2015, thank you. And it was after that moment, that was that turning point for me. That was when I really started losing interest in the church. And let me tell you, it was the church itself. This is why people go through so much religious trauma. Because when you are told from a young age that if you like the same sex, if you like the same gender, if you are homosexual or even bisexual, if you're basically, if you're not strictly heterosexual, then you're going to go to hell. You're going to burn in hell for all eternity because God is against that and everything. But the whole thing is they talk about, oh, well, God knows the beginning and your end. So if God knows the beginning and my end, wouldn't God know what my sexuality was going to be, what my sexual orientation was going to be? Maybe I knew I was bisexual since I was 13 years old. I was in the seventh grade when I knew that I liked both genders. I liked boys first. But then when I got older, I was like, I kind of like girls, too. And now at this point, I embrace it fully. Really deep down, I'm pansexual. But that's where I have really expanded to. But yeah, I have no issue with that. But for the longest time, I felt so much ashamed. I felt ashamed of myself. I felt so shame because I'm going to church and I, I love God. I believe in God. I want to, when I still believe that heaven was a geographical place, I'm like, I, I love God. I want to go to heaven. But I'm thinking, am, am I going to go to hell just because I like, I like girls too? You know what I'm saying? I like girls and I like men. Like, am I going to go to hell for that? You know what I'm saying? So, of course, I had hid that part of myself for so many years. And the fact that people are like, that's why people run in the closet. They say, you in the closet. That's why people run to the closet. And they don't come out and they don't express themselves as who they actually are because they're being so shamed in the church. Saying that God is disapproving of this. But they say that God loves you unconditionally. Oh, but God detests, like, detests your sexual orientation. Make it make sense. It was always just having these different rules about what what God is and what God loves and the rules and regulations and it's making people shame themselves. It's ridiculous. That's why people have so much religious trauma. They take, they be taking our money, but they're not giving back to the community. That's all these pastors want is money. And a lot of these black pastors, a lot of them are very egoic. They want to be seen as this great, big, great, mighty person. While all this respect, people respect me and I'm rich and I'm wealthy and I'm abundant. They want people to have, they want like all of the benefits. They want all of the benefits of being rich because if I could just stand in front of a pulpit, read the Bible, if I could just sit there and read my, here's my Bible right here. Shoot. If I could, here, woman, cut me up. If I could sit up here and read my Bible and have a message and create a message and preach to the people, to the congregation, my interpretation of that message and tell people to follow this and people are going to listen to me because a lot of Christians, they don't want to think for themselves. They, because Christian, we have been like, they brainwash us to believe that we cannot trust ourselves, that we cannot go within, that we have to be dependent on something outside of ourselves. We have to be dependent on another source. When you are working with the creator, you're not fully dependent on the creator. You work with the creator, co-creating. But they want us to, they want us to feel like we have to be dependent on something else so that we cannot to believe in ourselves and trust in ourselves and tap into our own power, tap into our own strength. So if we have to believe something outside of ourselves, then of course we have to believe, you know, we have to go to another person to deliver a, a word of God message to us. We have to go to another person to tell us what we should believe in and help us understand the Bible. And that's the thing. These Christians, they think like if I go to church and I have somebody tell preach this message to me and tell me everything that I need to know, then that's fine. I don't have to read the Bible in my own like daily life. I don't have to read the Bible outside of it because I can go ahead and go to church every Sunday. And this is why a lot of and it's it become it became so corrupt that people just feel like as long as they go through the motions of what it means to be Christian, as long as they, they perform as a Christian, then they're fine. A lot of Christianity has become very performative. It's performative. You had these people just performing it and everything just to, like, people want the attention. Like, they want to do this whole thing with the, do, 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 boom, 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 whatever they be trying to do, you know. You know what I'm saying? Like, like oh, look, they got the Holy Ghost. So everybody look at them. Give, give them all the attention. Like, it's performative. Okay. So, you have these people there these people are so brainwashed to think that in order for them to have their faith all they have to do is go through the motions all they have to do is perform all the right rituals all they have to do is follow these rules and boom they're christian they're this 
you know, holier than thou person, but they don't focus on the actual development of the self. These Christians, all they do is do what they can to satisfy their ego, to satisfy their flesh, but they're really not fulfilling their soul. A lot of these people be praying, but they don't even pray to the right God. They don't even know what God they're praying to. A lot of Christians don't even know how to hear the voice of God. A lot of Christians don't even have the Holy Spirit in their vessel. They don't even have the Spirit of God with them. A lot of Christians are not men and women of God. A lot of them aren't because they think, oh, if I just dress modest and I just dress up for church and I stop cursing and I stop smoking and I stop drinking, I stop going to the club, then yeah, I'm a, hor I'm a wonderful Christian. I'm still a horrible person, but if I go to church, then I'm not a horrible person. Like, no, bro. They do everything to make their flesh and their ego look good to protect their image, but they do so little when it comes to their actual soul. A lot of these people are corrupt. And a lot of them are so like are so brainwashed that they have no idea that they're blindly following a faith that they don't even need to follow. They have no I it's like if you ever try talking to some of these Christians and they we bring up the truth about how they always talk about like, oh, well, you know, in the Bible, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. OK, yeah, but baby, but the Bible is whitewashed and watered down. And first of all, you're reading the NIV version. That's the most, you know, corrupt version of the Bible. Read that King James version. You see this? King James version. And them Christians don't want to read that version because it requires them to actually use their inference, actually have to reflect on the <clears throat> reflect on the words that they are actually reading. It's not just carefully just spelled out for them. That's why a lot of them read that NIV version. They be, oh, well, you know, in the Bible, it says this and the Bible, it says that. OK, so what? What else? What ha what exactly ha what connection do you have with God that is not outside of the that's outside of the Bible, you know? And the thing is, you you would like spiritual people will tell Christians like, okay, but the Bible is watered down and whitewashed and all this kind of stuff, and they'll go, yeah, people say that, but still, I don't believe that. I just believe that the Bible just has everything, and I just want to believe my Bible because I'm a Christian and I love my Bible. They really be working my nerves. And I swear, it's like when you sit there, <laughs> I'm, I'm calm now. I swear, like when I talk to Christians, it's like when you're a spiritual person talking to a Christian that is so brainwashed, humbly speaking, we are like light years ahead of those people. Not even trying to like, yeah, freaky. We don't just toot our own horn. We are like light years ahead of them. The fact that our third eye is wide open and we, we overstand, we are outside that little bubble that Christianity has. We see everything for what it is. We see much broader beyond the perspective and they see such, they see it like this. We see it like this. I'm telling you, we're like light years ahead of those people. So when we be talking our spiritual language, they can't even understand because we speak in two different languages because we're speaking from two different frequencies. That's what it is. Christians are on a certain frequency, but spiritual people are people that are of different religions, whether they're Islam or whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Hinduism. We are on a totally different frequency because we are connecting with our soul. We are connecting with within ourselves, connecting to source, connecting to our higher consciousness. Because we're on a different frequency. That's what it is. And a lot of these Christians, I swear to you, not a lot of Christians are very low vibrational. Not all of them are. Some of them are not like they're not low vibrational but they're not super high vibrational they're just at a good medium stance and their frequency they're not low vibrational they're not high they're right in the middle you know what i'm saying but they they can only go so far like they at this point this is as far as they can go that's as far as they can go because they refuse to open up their third eye and expand and be expansive like they are a you know, high vibrational Christian, but they're not a high vibr but they're not a high frequency being. They're not. Because their mind is so closed. It's people that I used to love, look up to and admire that I see how they're still just such a corrupt Christian. And I'm just like, I just brainwash Christian. And I'm just like, I, it's like, I can't even connect with those people anymore because I just, 
they just like when we are we were, I was having a conversation with a relative one time and I was talking about my abusive family and stuff like that and they're like well do you think that um do you think that your dad is gonna go to heaven and baby if you could have heard what I was saying in my head I was saying like well baby heaven and hell is not a geographical place it's more so states of consciousness and it's more of a vibration but that conversation is just too up in the ethers for you. I don't even think you're going to even understand that. So I had to bring my myself down to basically be like, let me speak your language. Let me come on down to your neck of the woods and be like, well, I don't think that he would actually go to heaven if, if we talk in that language. But I'm like, baby, I, I've, I've grown past heaven and hell. Like, I clearly know that that's not a geographical place. I clearly know that that's a states of consciousness but you know if i were to say that they wouldn't be able to understand me that's why conversations with christians just be so like it be in loops you be on a hamster wheel you be in circles cycles because they can't think outside the box and it's frustrating because they be thinking that they're right but you in a fish tank i'm in the ocean baby you know the whole like baby you know majority of the earth is taken up by ocean there's more ocean than land there's more water on this earth than land. I'm in the ocean, baby. You in a fish tank. <sighs> to my next point. The second thing that the black church takes away is they take away our time. Our time. Every Sunday, we got to go to church. And that's the thing about, about the performance of Christians is that people feel like they're holier than thou because they go to church every Sunday or are like, no, we have to go to church because I want people to see us going to church. It's all performative. It's all for an ego. It's all to boost their own ego. Excuse me. And don't get me started about how the black churches be taking so long with their services. Sometimes they be going over like they be getting all up into the whatever. They just continue to go on. Especially in them Baptist churches, people be in church all day just to feel like they're holier than now and feel like they're better and feel like they're much of a better Christian because look at me, like I've, I've been in church for five hours today. Baby, Sunday is your day of rest. You need to be sitting down and resting and relaxing somewhere. And you got to get up and go to work in the morning and you still ain't had your time. Nah, nah, bro. And you even have those times where like, you know how sometimes we're like church can go over and and you know if, if church just lasts too long and you have people getting up and starting to walk out because they're like i'm gonna leave i'm not staying here no more i didn't have my time i want to go home i want you to go home and then you have those people that are only in there for the aesthetic only in there for their image only in there for their reputation only in there for their ego those be the main ones that be sitting there because they're like I don't want to be perceived. I don't want to get up and, and walk out. I don't want to be one of those people that people are staring at me. I don't want people perceiving me as, oh, you got some place to be. You think you better. I don't want people judging me for getting up and walking out, even though they know they want to go. They want to get up and go out, even though they know they want to go home. But they don't want to do that because they're afraid of what people are going to think about them. They're afraid of how people are going to perceive them. You got too many Christians in there performative christians self-proclaimed christians that are really just performative that are only in there just to satisfy their own ego satisfy their own flesh because if you really didn't care about what other people thought about you and you said i want to go home i don't care what they think about me you would get up and go but they'd be so worried about what people think about them they have to sit there i know because my parents are one of them we would have we had to sit there that whole entire time and i'm like i'm ready to go but if they're not getting up i couldn't get up i used to hate that shit all because they're afraid there was another time when I had went to like I'm digressing for a hot second where there was this one time where I was in the eighth grade and um we had went to this like every Sunday not every Sunday every year around like December our the high school that I went to would have like this open house pretty much where like it was for other people to like other people from around to come basically see the school and stuff like that and it was always on a Sunday afternoon and it'll be like after church so I remember how um there was this one day that we were getting ready like there was this one day we went to church and my mom was like we're gonna go over to Mar we're gonna go over to the high school I'm gonna go to Marion Catholic and we're gonna go to their open house directly after church so I had brought me a change of clothes and then I remember asking I was like 
well, can I change this to my change of clothes? Because we're going to be walking around and I don't want to sit there in my dress. I want to put on some jeans. I had just got me this new pair of pink Converse. That was like my favorite pair of shoes at the time. I was like, I want to, you know, walk around in my in my pants and, you know, be more comfortable when I'm walking around. I don't want to be in my, my church <clears throat> my church clothes all day. My mom goes, no, you're not changing your clothes because I want other people to see that we just came from church. Because I want other people to see that we just came from church you won't let me change my clothes because you care more about what those people think about you you care more about what strangers think about you you are so insecure that you care so much about what other people think about you why can't you care about what your own self thinks about you why can't you be confident so yeah it's ridiculous baby and let's not talk about no let's talk about it let's talk about you have you have stuff like bible study you have like friday night services you have other type of services that you have throughout the week and so many people want to go to those services they want to do stuff throughout the church let's not forget you know when it was halloween and they wouldn't let you celebrate halloween so they say oh we got to go to the hallelujah night let's go to church on halloween so everybody can see how we're so holy let, let your kids have a good time let your kids have fun let them like they didn't wear their costume to school today they didn't had a halloween party at school they got kicked up in on sugar and cupcakes and candy let them have a good time let them go trick-or-treating it's nothing demonic about that holiday stop thinking stop letting this this christianity brainwash you but no they they want to make sure that their image is, is taken care of they want to make sure that they feel better they want to make sure that people perceive them a certain way it's all about being perceived and it's all about being accepted by a white man that's it that's it <sighs> then when you have stuff like when it's we just celebrated new year's when it be new year's eve and they want to go to watch night servers and stuff like that and let's pray into the new year let's let's worship and do that for the rest of the Sometimes it's okay to take a break. Sometimes it's okay to give things a rest. Just like you don't want to always have to work out every single day. You want to give yourself a rest. Sometimes it's okay. You don't have to always be praising and worshiping all the time. It's okay. You can have a relationship with God without having to go to every single thing that the church has. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times people, a lot of times we would just be forced to go to that stuff. And it's just, let's go to the watch night service so that everybody can see that I'm a holier than thou person because I'm choosing to go to church. I'm choosing to go to church on New Year's Eve. The rest of you all, I'm better than you because you all are getting drunk and getting high. And I'm in church. I'm better than you because you all are in the comfort of your own home, relaxing while I'm in this packed up church with all this noise and all these bright lights. That's just my autism thing with the bright lights and all the noise. But anyway, still. It's all performative. It's all for people to perceive them in a certain way. That's why you have so many corrupt people that under the guise of Christianity because they feel like what they're following is exactly what they need to follow, but they don't ever question it. They never question what's taught in church because they don't do their own inference. A lot of these Christians, they may pray on Sundays while they're in church. They may read the Bible with the pastor in church, but not one time throughout the week do they ever pick up that Bible six days a week. Monday through Saturday, they don't ever pick up that Bible. Monday through Saturday, you barely see them praying. Barely. Because they think if they just do it on Sunday, then everything is fine. Nah, bro. Uh-uh. That's why a lot of people in Islam are high vibrational because they pray five times a day. They pray five times a day. Get themselves grounded. You know what I'm saying? So they actually incorporate prayer life, their own connection with God, their own type of, you know, relationship with God in their own individual daily life. Like they encourage that in your daily life. It's not just, oh, we pray on our holy day. No, you pray every day. And for people in Islam, their, their Sunday, okay, our Sunday, like, I'm sorry, the Christian Sunday is like the Friday. I'm sorry. In Christianity, Sunday is the holy day that people go to church. In Islam, Friday is their holy day that people go to mosque. Thank you. Forgive me. <sighs> Took me a while to get that out, but that's what it is. So you don't see them only praying on Fridays. No, they pray every single day. That's why it's like, you know, um, like Christianity is just very performative. People just think that they just, as long as they just do the right things and follow the right rituals, that oh, they're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. No, bro. So yeah, they take up our time. The last thing is they 
is hope. They take away our hope because they make it seem as if, you know, I'm trying to think of how he explained it. Like, let me just take my own thing to it is where basically what the Christian church does. Oh, thank you. Basically what the Christian church does is, um, you're speaking from the outside, sweetie. I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church my whole a, a goddamn life. So fuck you. Anyway, um, speaking from experience anyway. Um, but anyway, uh, let's say, let me say this, is that they take away your hope. Okay. They take away your hope because basically you're out here, you're going to church every day and all this kind of stuff. And basically they make it seem like you can't trust within yourself. You can't rely on your own strength to get things done. You have to basically rely on God to do all this for you, for God to fix everything for you. And you have to just wait on God where you're just sitting here waiting on God to change things for you when you have the power to change things for yourself. That's what they say. Faith without works is dead. They think if, if all I have is the faith, I don't have to put in the work and everything is just going to come to me. No. And that's why they only realizing that we have the power to change our own reality, but we don't do that. That keeping us stuck and stagnant. That's why Christianity was invented to keep us stuck, to keep us stagnant, to keep us from tapping into our power, to keep us from tapping into our full potential, to keep us from recognizing who we really are. The way that the black community is suffering is because they don't know who they are. And it's not all of us, but a lot of black people in the black community are suffering because they don't know who they truly are because they didn't question anything. They just blindly followed blind faith, blindly believing everything, but they didn't question anything. They didn't challenge anything. And by not asking questions, by not challenging anything, you're just blindly following. You're just going off of somebody else's narrative. But the people that actually challenge things and question things, oh, they're disrespectful, oh, they're corrupt, oh, they're demonic. No, shut up. They're not. They actually have the courage and the confidence to act and the security within themselves to act and the intelligence and the wisdom and the discernment to think, I don't know if I can believe all this. I want to try to find things out for myself because they have the courage to think for themselves. They have the courage to think for themselves. They're not just blindly following something. A lot of times in Christianity, you have the blind leading the blind. making it seem like we can't go out and do things on our own we have to just wait on magic sky daddy to come do things for us no you better work with god and meet god halfway that's what it is you meet god halfway so of course the pastor's gonna get in front of you and say no just just keep coming to church keep paying your tithes keep giving me money and then you just wait on god to fix everything for you and the whole narrative just wait for jesus to come back and you're gonna get your rewards in heaven while everybody else gets to have their heaven on earth no and then all these people sitting here waiting. People have waited their whole lives for Jesus to come back. And they went to their grave and Jesus never came back. Because it's a false story. It's a false narrative. Jesus ain't finna split the sky and come down on his white horse blowing his trumpet. That's not finna happen. That's a story. It's a fable. The actual Jesus coming back is us raising our Christ. is us tapping into Christ consciousness and everyone becoming aware of what's really happening. People need to wake up. That's the problem. They're not awake. They're asleep. A lot of people out here sleepwalking. They sleepwalking, sleep living. Just out here sleepwalking, doing whatever they think they need to do. Not even realize how asleep they are. And that's the issue. And a lot of them are so brainwashed. And a lot of them just want to stick to what they feel is comfortable. That they don't want to try nothing new. They don't want to challenge things. They don't want to question anything. And they don't even realize how they're not even living their life up to their fullest potential. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just like, it's ridiculous. I'm trying to put this back in this case. Okay, you know what? Skip it. I'm not going to do, that, do all that. But, yeah, so that's what it is. And that's the thing. People be are believing the stories and the narratives that they have told that they have been told that when the truth is actually staring them in the face and people are telling them the truth they don't want to hear it they don't want to believe it they don't because they're uncomfortable with a lot of people are uncomfortable with being wrong a lot of people are uncomfortable with having to admit that they believe something that is false a lot of people have a big issue with that they don't want to believe that they believe in something that is not true they want to hold on to their beliefs so tightly that they feel like it's going to be a bruise to their ego to realize like, wow, I was 
blindly following something that's not even true. They'd rather stick to it because it feels comfortable. They'd rather stick to it because it makes their ego feel good. So yeah. Whoever said you think you're a goddess, I know I'm a goddess. And get the fuck about in my life if you have an issue with that. I'm not religious. I will curse. I'm going to activate that fucking throat chakra. If you have a problem, here you go. Y'all trolls be trying to get attention from people. So anyway, as we're saying, that's the issues with the black church. And once black people can awaken to what's happening and they can move away from the black church and stop investing their money into the black church, I think that's what we have to stop giving them. We have to fight them where, where it is. Where basically, um, where basically what we have to do is to fight against it is if the black church is taking our money, stop giving the black church our money and see how they keep that stuff up. Oh, that was another thing that um, he had that Dr. Uma brought up collectively throughout the entire United States of America every Sunday he said it's about three million dollars that the black church collectively like basically if every single black church across America was to put all of the money that they give to the church every Sunday into this big old you know big old bank account and deposit it into like one bank account it'll be three million dollars across 50 states of all of the black churches so with all of that money three million dollars per sunday once a month they are earning three million dollars collectively all of that money that they can do with, with that kind of stuff you realize what you can do with that type of money but no they just keeping that money to sit on that stuff they just want to sit on their wealth that's why we say all of the money is in the wrong hands because you got people sitting on their wealth and they having all this money while people in the congregation are like, you know, struggling financially. So, yeah, that's one thing we got to stop. We have to stop giving the church our money. We have to stop giving the church our money and we have to. Um... OK, where is this person? Because I'm going to meet them because they find they work on my goddamn nerves. Um one thing we have to stop doing is we have to stop stop giving the church our money that is what it is oh there you go thank you for saying something all right okay the one thing is to stop giving the church our money the second thing second thing is to stop giving the church our time stop giving them our time they're taking up our time they're taking up our energy for that not to be reciprocated once you have less people going to church then at this point pastors gonna have to wake up and realize that they have to start doing things differently they're gonna have to start using their the money righteously and actually do the right deeds instead of just sitting on the wealth and that's another thing that dr umar had brought up he was saying that he has an issue with the lack of deeds that the black church is giving with all of this money. Instead of them actually giving back to the community, doing good deeds, doing righteous deeds, they're just sitting on that wealth. So if we stop giving them our money, we stop giving them our time. We're like, until you can start giving stuff to us in the community, we're not going to give you any more of our money. We're not going to give you any more of our time because you need to have something here that's going to give back to us. It needs to be reciprocal. That's how you build a church community. But if we're in community with you and you're not in community with us, what is the problem? What is the issue? How is that going to resolve anything? <clears throat> and then the last one is we have to have hope within ourselves. We have to take the we have to take our power back. Take our power back and to realize that we don't need to always go to church every Sunday in order for us to feel like we are a, you know, holy person. We don't have to always listen to what somebody else thinks about the word of God and the story that they tell and what the message is behind it. We don't have to always listen to that. We can have our own inference. We can do our own study. That's why the people that are the most faithful, the people that have the strongest relationship with God are not of any religion because you don't need a religious narrative. But a lot of people are afraid of to living a life without religion. But that's the most liberating thing you can do for yourself. There was something else. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought, but it's going to come back. <clears throat> oh, there, there we go. Thank you. 
another thing is that a lot of these pastors a lot of these pastors don't real are not really in it for actually helping thank you for the roses baby they're not really in it to actually help the congregation they're not in it for the people they're not in it for the people they're only in it to actually basically like okay thank you they are in it for themselves but they're not in it because they actually want to help the people because basically what happens is you know pastors are not just pastors they can be the role of like a mentor or like a mediator or like a, a therapist i know they're not like a licensed therapist and stuff but they can give you know spiritual thank you spirit spiritual therapy to people you know what i'm saying because when you have lived your experience and you have been through certain life circumstances and your faith in god has increased despite your circumstances like you have overcome so much hardship so much trauma in your life and your faith has gotten it has increased and you're you have grown with god and you're basically saying like you can be like a spiritual teacher a spiritual therapist to people to be like this is how you can overcome this with the help of god because this is how i did it this is how like you don't have to have to do everything that i've done but this is a way that you can do it is giving the wisdom when wisdom is gained wisdom needs to be shared but a lot of these pastors don't want to do that. They don't want to help the people. They don't want to help the congregation. They want to basically, you know, they get very annoyed by people that need the pastor's help. You know, people want to come to the pastor's office and have meetings to help them. They, you know, pastors can be marriage counselors at times. Pastors can be, you know, family counselors and stuff like that. And they're not really in it to like help the people. They're not really... A lot of times they don't want to help the people. A lot of times like they can get annoyed or they can get impatient and they'll may say things to the, the people that they're helping that are very rude or just very insensitive or very passive aggressive. And let me tell you something. The church that I went to, that I was raised up in, my I had went to my pastor one time back when I was like, I was like, what, 18, 19 years old, maybe 18, 18 years old went to my pastor and basically he's telling me how he's like you know i have people that are sending me nasty emails cursing me out and people have left the church and they talk about they don't want to come back and they've left me nasty emails and they they cursing me out and stuff like that and i'm kind of and he kind of was making it seem like he was the victim in the situation but after like knowing what he did to me i can understand where they probably were coming from and they want to sit up here they want to play the victim they want to act like they didn't do nothing wrong but it's like why would and i had asked him i was like why would a person curse you out you're a pastor he's i don't know why they always say they don't know why you know why yes you do because why would a person go curse out a pastor why would a person give a strongly worded email to a pastor why would people want to leave the church obviously the pastor did something that rubbed them the wrong way obviously the pastor did something to push them away obviously the pastor did something personally to them because if they felt personally attacked and they had to come back and personally attack the pastor it's because the pastor did something to them and i know this from my own experience i had made a video about this but listen i'm gonna reiterate and that basically make a long story short i'm not talking to my narcissistic dad i have gone completely no contact with him i have blocked his number and everything and i have made content exposing him and speaking my truth so what happened is um i had ended up doing some things where like there was this one day where i had made a video about how horrible of a father i had and how much i feel empty because of the lack of love that i had and i basically sent the video directly to my dad via email like you know how you like i wish i could tag my dad in this i actually sent it directly to him like i'm like i want you to know exactly how i feel about you i want to tell you directly that queen of swords gemini i don't care how i'm making you feel at this point because if you hurt me i'm gonna let you know you hurt me so anyway what happened is that um my dad reached out to my pastor and was talking to him and my dad was like well i just don't know why my daughter is not talking to me she's blocked my number i just don't know what i've done wrong i don't know what's going on we don't have a relationship anymore and i just don't understand what's going on and she's making me these videos about me on her social media and i really just wish that she would stop so i'm just wondering if i can give you her number i'm wondering if you can go ahead and have a conversation with her and call her up and see what's going on and maybe you can talk to her and see if she's gonna stop sending me stop i'm um, sending me 
me videos or stop talking about me on her social media and stop bringing that to the and bringing my business out there that bastard was only caring about his image all he was caring about was his own reputation he didn't care about the pain and hurt that he caused me he didn't care about being a better father to me he didn't care about helping heal my pain he didn't care about taking accountability for how i felt all he cared about was his own reputation so what happened is this actually happened very very recently you all this is was around okay it wasn't december it was either like was it november it was november it was november okay okay either november or october i can't it had to have been okay i'm sorry i'm months is running together but it was either october or november october or november when my pastor calls me so first of all like i know that i did not give my pastor my number so anytime like i get like a number anytime like somebody calls my phone and it's not a contact i'm not about to answer that because i don't know who you are because i'd be thinking it'd be scammers you know robo calls you know what i'm saying so i don't answer that kind of stuff but what happened is i didn't answer the phone call so what happened is my pastor has sent me a text message and he said hey this is pastor so-and-so you know um can you give me a call so i'm like oh okay so at that point my intuition was like why else would my pastor randomly be calling me out of the freaking blue my intuition was telling me i'm like you know what i think yo did i think my daddy done reached out to pastor and that's exactly what pastor was calling me because of everything that i have been saying and doing and dealing with my dad i feel like this is about my dad so what happens is my i call my pastor i phone him up and he's like you know he's like hey what's going on um do you know why i'm calling you and i'm like well pastor my intuition is telling me that this is about my dad is that what this is about he's like your intuition is correct it is about your dad so I'm basically giving my side of the story about what has happened between me and my dad and everything like that. And I'm telling him, I'm like, well, this is how, he, this is what he has done to me over the course of my life. This is how he has made me feel. I have basically said he's made me feel like he's very abusive. He's neglected me. He's abandoned me. He has, you know, lacked a lot of love in my parents and his parenting towards me and just it's just a lot and i'm just at a point in my life right now i'm like i feel like he really wasn't around like he was present but he was emotionally distant and emotionally unavailable and he's very rude he's very mean i don't want him in my life anymore i'm at a point now in my adulthood where if i've survived all these years without having him in my life i can survive the rest of my life without having him in my life because he really doesn't bring anything into my life but chaos but stress i don't need that and I'm like, yes, I have blocked my dad's number and everyone has an issue with that. But I tell them I pay my own phone bill. I have two phones. This one right here. I have a work phone and I have a cell phone. The phone I'm using right now is my work phone. This phone right here is my cell phone, both phones. So I'm saying if they want, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, listen. If people want to control who I'm block and who I don't block, then send me the $200 a month that it costs to pay for both of these phones send me the money so if you want to control what i do with my phones then pay my phone bill but like people have said like when i was younger all right people told me like oh well when you get your own money and you pay your own bills then you can control what you do but until then if i'm paying your bills i'm in control so say okay well now i pay for this phone bill i don't ask you out for a dime for this phone bill if i'm late paying my phone bill because for whatever reason that's fine but that phone bill still gets paid i have had my own phone bill since 2021 and there are there are people in my family that still need mama phone bill and still my mom is still paying her phone bill but that's neither here nor there but anyway i'm like i pay my own cell phone bill so if, if i get to control everything like y'all said when i have my own bills i can pay my own thing so yeah so if you're not gonna pay for this phone then you don't get to tell me who i can and cannot block i hit them with that every time and they be speechless because they know that i win with that one they know i take my power back with that one that's what i'm telling you baby your money is your power when you have when you like I'm, literally money is power like that's how it is in life like really the people that have the most money have the most power like that's that's in that's a given you know what i'm saying so it's like if you want to have a little bit more power over your life when you have narcissistic ass people in your life you have to have your own money because that's how you're going to have more power okay i'm telling you don't allow that to become greed don't allow yourself to get greedy with money and all that kind of stuff so where you're just doing anything to get money you don't want to don't make that love don't make money turn you evil don't make money make you do evil acts but at the end of the day 
when you have money you have power when you have like i mean think about it when you have money when you go to the car dealership you have buying power when like the people say if you got like if you got like 10 bands in your hand and you go to a car dealership you can get anything you want because you have buying power because you have the cash at hand rich people when they go ahead and they say when you want to get you a house buy your house cash you have buying power i'm telling you you got buying power when you got cash that's it you got to just play the game you got to just play the game right so anyway um that's what it is it's like you know you just you have more power over yourself basically it's you taking when you are financially responsible for yourself you're taking your power back away from other people that they've had it and you have the power over your own life is what i'm trying to say okay so anyway i'm like people may not like the fact that i have been blocked but i'm like whatever so at that point i'm sorry i digressed a lot but the point i'm trying to make is that like um, I had that conversation with my pastor and I was telling him like, no, I'm going to keep him blocks and everything. And my pastor actually did agree with me. He was like, you know what, like based off the conversation that you had and based off of everything that and the hurt that you have been through, I do agree that you need to keep your dad blocked because you got heated while we were on the phone talking about your dad. So obviously there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain that you're still dealing with because even just talking about him got you all riled up. So really you're in no position to be around your dad right now. You're in no position to really be talking to your dad right now because it's going to be explosive. You need to allow yourself space from him. You need to allow you all to breathe you need to create some distance from the two of you so that you all can so that you can heal so that you can be better so i agree with you blocking him that was one thing that he you know validated he's like i'll give you that i'll respect your decision for that he respected my boundaries thank you boundaries so um and then what happened is he's like now um is there anything that you want from your dad and I'm saying like, well, what I want from my dad is I want him to, oh, I want him to take accountability for what he has done to me and the hurt and pain that he's caused me. And I want him to apologize. I do want my dad to apologize to me. I understand that sometimes we may not always get an apology. I understand that we may have to go without it. But if that's something that I want, I'm going to just say that's what I want. I want him to take accountability and I want an apology from him. And I told him, I'm like, I'm like, well, pastor, you know what? Like, I would be willing to, you know, have a conversation with him if we can have a conversation with you. I don't want to because I have I'm like, pastor, I have tried talking to my dad directly one on one because that's something that anytime I talk about the issues that I have with my narcissistic parents, they always ask me, have you tried talking to them? Have you had a conversation with them? Yes ample times multiple times i have had conversation with them one on one but the issue was that because they deflect so much because they gaslight so much nothing really gets resolved it's to no avail because they don't want to hear it from me but if they can hear it from an outside source from a third party from a mediator maybe they'll actually hear where i'm coming from so i'm saying at this point i don't want to talk to him one on one i'd rather have a person that he respects like you pastor and have us talk to him so if we want to be able to have a meeting where we can come to your office and we can have a conversation i would be willing to have a conversation with him if you could be there and be our mediator that's the only way because my dad is doesn't believe in therapy he doesn't want to go to any therapy session and he talked about wanting to come into my therapy session but only because he wants to basically give his perspective on things because basically he just wants to retell the narrative not because he wants to understand my hurt Cause he talks about my dad has talked about saying like maybe i can come in one of your therapy sessions just to kind of like tell your your therapist my perspective on things because one's perspective is one's reality and maybe if i can kind of give my take on things maybe they'll be they'll able to understand what's really going on not about i want to come into your therapy session so i can understand why you're hurting so much and where this hurt is coming from and understand your hurt and understand how i can help you with this hurt no it ain't about that he ain't there to help me with my hurt. He's only there to control his narrative. He's only there because he wants to be in control. And that's how a lot of these parents are. So I told my pastor, I was like, well, if he's willing to have a meeting with you, like have a meeting with the both of us and take accountability and apologize, then yes, I would like to do that. That is what I want from him. You ask my question, what do I want from him? That's my answer. You could tell him that. So then my pastor ends up calling my dad back and reiterating what I said to him. And then at that point, he ended up 
my ended up calling my pastor called me back and per my pastor basically my dad said to my pastor well you know what i would be willing to take accountability i would be willing to apologize i would be willing to do that and then my past like then my dad also said but what i really would like is i really just want her to stop making those videos that she's posting talking about me exposing me on her social media i want that to cease to exist that's what i want i i want her to stop doing that then my pastor calls me and he's telling me like oh well you know what like your dad did say that he was taking accountability and he will apologize but also when i want to i want to get an okay from you that what your dad wants is your dad wants you to stop making these videos on social media and what i want to get from you is i want an okay from you that these videos about your dad are going to cease to exist cease to exist that i'm going to get an okay from you that you're going to stop doing what you're doing and speaking your truth and telling you know making these videos about your dad basically that's what i want an okay from you about and that's what he said and then right after that he's saying and you know a lot of this stuff about you like and you know like i do have other I, I do have a life i do have other things that i have to get this is what my pastor was saying to me y'all he's like now listen i do have a life i do have other things that i have get going on i do have other responsibilities i do have other people that want my help and need my help and people that i have to you know counsel i do have other phone calls that i have to make and this whole thing with you and your dad really is wasting my time here so really i just want to know if you're going to cease to exist these videos so that we can be over and done with it So basically, my pastor, someone that has known me for 20 years, because I was six years old when our family joined that church, the same pastor that baptized me, the same pastor that I sat in his office at times talking to him when I'm going through stuff is the same person that's telling me that my pain, my trauma, and these issues is wasting his time. When I'm not even the one that reached out to him this time, it was my dad. So you want to tell me that I'm wasting your time? You know what? Honestly, dude, I felt like he had the... I felt like my pastor didn't have the balls to say that to my dad. So he wanted to say it to like another man and they around the same age. So actually my pastor's older than my dad, like by like 10 years. But anyway, he didn't want to say that to another man. So he wants to say that to a young woman, a woman that's young enough to be his child. Like his, his children are all grown. He has grown children, grandchildren. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm close in age. I'm closer in age to my pastor's oldest granddaughter than I am to his youngest child. All of his children are in their 30s and up. Okay, you know what I'm saying? His youngest granddaughter is 18 years old. I'm closer to her age. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, Pastor, not only am I young enough to be your child, but I'm young enough to be your grandchild. And this is how you're talking to me? This is how you're treating me? Okay. After that, we got off the phone and it, it took me back for a minute. Like I was very much in shock, but I'm just because it's like I had so much respect for my pastor. But all of that respect, I swear, it just went down the drain. I like completely lost respect for him, completely lost respect for him because I'm like, you're a pastor. You're here to help people and to help counsel people. This is a part of your profession. You chose this profession and now you're getting irritated with what you have to do with your profession. You're making other people feel like they're wasting your time. Who wants to hear that, dude? That's the equivalent of like you talking to a therapist and your therapist is telling you, this is wasting my time talking about this. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Then why are you in this profession in, in the first place, bro? That's just not what you do. That's like you going to the dentist because you have a toothache. You know what I'm saying? You need a root canal and they, you know what? This is wasting my time. I don't want to help you. I don't want to help you get out of your pain. I don't want to, I don't know what to do with you. That's like you going to the doctor and you got a tumor and you telling your doctor you got these issues and you like, I feel like all this, like, I feel like such as pain in my chest. I don't know where it's coming from. And your doctor telling you, well, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you're just wasting my time here. I have other patients that I have to get to. That's how he made me feel. And listen, understandably, like, he probably has a lot of other people that has, you know, um, like a lot of other people that has, you know, came to him with their problems and all of this kind of stuff. And it's probably a mixture of a lot of people. But for him to project that pain onto me was wrong. It was wrong. 
because I'm like, I'm not even the one you really mad at. You probably mad at other people. But the fact that you took the anger out on me is wrong. Regardless, you're harming the innocent. That's not what you do. That's one thing that God detests is when you harm the innocent. You're harming somebody that ain't did nothing to you. So, yeah, right, like I can understand like as a human, people get tired. People get irritated. Pe like I understand people can get tired of things, but you don't want to make a person feel bad about it. You don't want to shame them. You don't want to say that that rude passive aggressiveness to them because you don't know how a person's going to take that. People that have been abused and people that go through trauma, they already get invalidated enough. They already get abused enough. And basically you're kicking them while they're down. You gonna help them. like it's like basically you reaching your hand out to help them up just to push them back down. It's like everything that you did for me now is null and void. It doesn't even make any sense. It's like, how can I even respect all that you have done when you just that's how you decided to end it? That's my personal situation. And that's why I probably will never set foot in that church ever again. Never. He should have communicated that better. Yes, absolutely. I feel like he should have. Like, I can understand his human. I can understand he's human. However, I'm human too. And my feelings are valid. And him as an elder. Patience. Him as an elder should have handled that better. He should have handled it better. So, yeah. That's why I was so upset. That's why I felt so disrespected. I'm like, I haven't been to church in years. I haven't talked to you in years. And this is what I deal with the very second time I talk to you. And that's why a lot of us aren't thinking about Yes, boo. Yes, exactly. One of my, well, this is one of my friends on TikTok. I have known her. We go to the same church. Shantina, we go to the same church. Baby, Shantina can sing her butt off, boo. Ooh, can't wait for you. I can't wait for you to win your Grammy, baby. You win all your siblings. Y'all gonna win a Grammy. Yes, I love it. But nah, but... A lot of us, a lot of the young people, we moved away from that stuff because we realized how corrupt this shit is. It's like, bro. So anyway, I'm going to wrap up because I got overwhelmed. I got a little overstimulated. <laughs> oh, thank you, boo. Thank you. Love you so much. But um, yeah, so I'm just like, that's what I wanted to talk about. Wanted to talk about the black church. Wanted to talk about how corrupt it is and how like why it's so corrupt and why we need to move away from it okay because the way that they're doing things is just just out of order it's just completely out of order so yeah i'm gonna end this here i thank you all so much for being here with me i thank you all so much for hearing me out thank you for thank you all so much for just holding space for me so that i can get this off my chest and talk about what i had talked about because yes i was talking about the stuff of the black church but i also vented a lot and told you a lot about what i was dealing with as well because i had to get that off my chest i had to purge that poison out of me so i really appreciate you all i thank you all so much i love you all thank you i hope you have an amazing rest of your saturday i hope you have an amazing rest of your weekend and it's a three-day weekend for those of you that are off school or off work because you don't have it. I hope you enjoy your three-day weekend if you have Monday off. Please get your rest. It's winter time. It's your time to rest. It's your time to recharge. Go into your turtle shell. We got this. Thank y'all. Love you.